I, uh, I'm going to refer to some of my notes here. Um, I, some of you, some of you probably heard, I, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, so I was 26. I lived in Connecticut six years. I lived in Southern California 31 years, and I lived in, I moved to Utah in 2021. While I lived in Southern California, um, I became a volunteer at the California Institution for Women, which is the, one of the three women's prisons in the California prison system. And I volunteered there for 19 years. Um, and I mentored three women. Um, just to give you a little background about the, about, I'm going to call it CIW because it's like really long to keep saying California Institution for Women. Um, the original CIW was dedicated in 1932 in Tehachapi. There was uh, a women's prison earlier. Uh, there was an earthquake in 1952, so they built one in Chino. California. I don't know how familiar any of you are for, with Southern California. Chino is approximately 45 miles from Los Angeles. It's in what's called the Inland Empire. It's, it's kind of out there. And, and, I, and I, I lived in Chino and Chino Hills for most of the 31 years I was there. Um, CIW was the only women's prison in California until about 1987 when the Northern California Women's Facility was open. Um, as I mentioned, previously mentioned, there are three women's prisons and 32 uh, men's prisons in the system. It's called the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, which is an interesting title considering that I don't know, I don't know if there's a lot of, there, there could be a lot of correction, but I don't know so much about rehabilitation, but okay. Um, as of 2020, there were over 2,600 2, inmates at CIW. This number was re, has been reduced due to the cor coronavirus. They, they actually tried to find people that they felt were low risk and allow them to leave the prison to relieve the overcrowding. Uh, CIW ha houses levels one through four. Level one is like the lowest level, low security in inmates. Level four are people that really need to be there. Um, several of the women who are involved in the Nick Manson family member uh, murders are at CIW. I actually know Leslie Van Houten. I've talked to her in the visiting room at CIW. Um, I, um, she comes, she's an interesting case. She comes up for parole every so often, and it's a big media circus when that happens. And um, she, I would say at this point, it's more political why her parole has not been granted uh, granted, some governors are not going to like, oh, you let one of the Manson family mur murderers out of prison. So um, Leslie is a very interesting person. She's in her mid to early, mid 50s, early 60s. And the person she, as far as I can tell, the person she is now is not the person that was involved in that. But that's just my opinion. Now, how did I get involved with prison ministry? Well, in the summer of 2000, summer of 2000, um, I was attending St. Paul the Apostle Catholic Church in Chino Hills, and there was a presentation by someone from the Match 2 prison industry, a prison ministry. They were looking for volunteers. So I'm in church. I'm listening to this person, you know, give the presentation, and I will tell you, I felt this tap upon my shoulder. I felt like, and I felt like, I would say I felt God, I felt the Lord saying, I want you to be involved with this. And I thought there's um, Matthew 25, which talks about among the things that Jesus says is I was in prison and you came and visited me. And I'm like, you want me to get involved with prison ministry? You've got to be kidding. Um, one, I will, one of the powerful inputs to that is at the time I lived in Chino Hills, the, the, the women's prison is surrounded by Chino, Chino Hills, Ontario. For the people that live in those communities, that prison and those people 
do not exist. In fact, there's 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 a men's prison. It's California Institution for Men that's also in Chino. And I lived a mile from the men's prison and eight miles from the women's prison. But psychologically, spiritually, emotionally, for the people that live in the areas around them, those places do not exist. Those people do not exist. Even though if you buy a home in that area, the realtors are required to tell you that there are correctional facilities in the area. And most people are like, it's, it's like this, an arm's length, okay? So what I did was, okay, I, you want me to do this, Lord, okay? I'm scared to death. Um, I attended a training during the summer. There was trainings held during the summer, we, you know, about, you know, what you're supposed to do, procedures. I had to fill out paperwork to be approved by the Department of Corrections to visit the prison. And then uh, in sometime in September, I made my first visit. And I'm going to just briefly describe the three women that I was uh, matched with. The first woman I visited from 2000 to 2010. Um, we were given general details about what the person had done, like, okay, the person is in here for this, but okay. My, my, the way I handle it is I would never talk to the woman about what she did. I never brought it up unless she wanted to talk about it, because what I was there for was to bring a little bit of the outside in to just give her give her something else to think about other than you know the prison environment, prison rules, prison you know regulations. And you know, I wasn't I wasn't there to just reinforce the fact like, well, you're in prison because you did such and such. That wasn't my role. Um the one the first woman had been at CIW for nearly 30 years. She was found suitable for parole 11 times. What her situation was is she had been in a relationship with a, a very abusive man. She had two daughters. This man killed one of her daughters and she was held complicit even though she was being abused. And there, there are unfortunately there are quite a few battered women at CIW in this situation. She was a model inmate. She uh, played the guitar for the Protestant services. She was a peer mental health um, counselor that, that um, there was, she was someone that other inmates could come and talk with about their issues and emotions and problems. She would make gift bags for other inmates because they would get donations and she would make that up. She would, uh, with permission, she would, you know, decorate the walls of the prison. She's quite an, an accomplished artist. I had corrections officers tell me she did not need to be there. I mean, when the, when the staff thinks you don't need to be there, <laughs> that's something. Um, she was finally released on August the 12th, 2010. I am going to cry and I'm not going to apologize to it because that was one of the best days of my life when I saw my beautiful princess walk out the gates because they told me I could come and see her. She walked out the gates and I had a rose and she, you know, they bring you out and the officers transport you. And the officer said, you can go greet your friend, you're free. I will never forget that day in my life because I knew, I knew she didn't need to be there. I knew what kind of person she was. My youngest son has met her and asked me within 10 seconds, mom, why was she ever in prison? She's been, she got out. Uh, she, she got a PhD from Fuller, which I had a little bit of something to do with that. I kind of helped her with that. Um, She's written several books. If you go out to um, Amazon, there's a, she's written a book called What Every Church Should Know About Prison Ministry. I, I don't, I'm not saying anybody's name, but if you, you know, go out and look for this book, you, you will see who she is. She just is an incredible person, a real testimony to just the power of the power of faith, the power of love, the power of not giving up. I mean, when you've been found suitable for parole 11 times and they don't let you out, that's, 
that is something to really have to overcome. The and let me know about the time if I'm you know exceeding it. Um, the second woman, second woman I mentored. Um, now by mentoring, I would write at least twice a month and visit at least twice a month. I usually wrote a little bit more. Sometimes I would visit three times a month because I live close to the prison. I visited with her. I mentored her from fall 2010 through uh, summer 2011. She'd been in prison on a drug charge and she was really anxious to get back to her children. I haven't heard from her, anything from her since she left CIW. The third woman who was in prison for financial fraud, I was requested by one of the lieutenants at the prison to come and visit her. They, they made a special request because ordinarily she would never have gotten a visit because she was, whenever you see television and you see the movies where like people are like visiting prison with the phone and behind the glass, those are prisoners that are what's uh, that are what's in called administrative segregation. Most prisoners in general population, there is a, a cafeteria like room with snack uh, machines on the side, and you sit at a table across from each other. Only prisoners that are segregated or are you know have done something, they get very limited visits. So she was in that situation. This woman has because she, she, she's gotten out. So she has, a, she had, a, at the time, she had a PhD in aeronautical engineering. She worked at JPL and NASA. She had, she, she worked for Boeing. She, you know, was this incredibly educated person. And the lieutenant figured out that she was struggling in prison because she didn't have anybody really to talk to. Unfortunately, most of the women in the, in, in the prison, if they got to sixth grade, that would be amazing. Um, they are women are tested when they come in here, come into the prison, and they are sent to classes because most, uh, many of them are actually functionally illiterate. Well, this woman was a PhD; she didn't have anybody to talk to, and because the lieutenant knew I had an education, I have a master's degree in theology from Loyola Marymount, of all places. He said, oh, she needs somebody educated to talk with. So that's why he he prevailed with the prison to allow me to come and see her. And I, and I did that. Um, so I gave her someone that she could relate to, someone that she could talk to on an edu you know, educated level. And I don't say that to put other people down because of, you know, because of what they've been through. But it was it was hard for her to relate to the other prisoners, but she could relate to me. Um, uh, she was released in 2019. She struggled a bit coming out. She's got a job now, but um, when you come out of prison, they basically put you out the door. They give you two hundred dollars and say good luck, hello, you know, have a nice life. And that's why there's such a high degree of recidivism. Why people return to prison because all of us know, all of us have struggled. I mean, you have to have a lot of support and infrastructure. I mean, now, if you don't have a smartphone or access to the internet, you can't apply for a job. I mean, the days of being able to walk into a, a, a company like, oh, here's my paper resume, companies don't do that. Everything's through the internet. You have systems that, you know, go through people's resumes and, and everything. So to push people out to, put people out the door with just $200 and, you know, no, no access to the internet, no way to have a phone for interviews and things like that, you know, they're, they're, they're at a significant disadvantage. So, you know, just to end, you know, on a reflection, every time I walked out the door of CIW, I was very conscious of the privilege of walking through the gates back to the outside. It's like, yeah, I could walk through those doors and go back to my life. Some of you may disagree with what I'm about to say, but this is kind of my perspective. There are women who are at CIW because they need to be there and society needs for them to be there. Yes, there are people there that are legitimately there. There are women who are at CIW basically because they were stupid. They did something stupid. They did, you know, made a mistake and they got caught. There are quite a few women at CIW who are there because they are mentally ill and poor, 
and prison has become the mental health treatment of last resort for the poor and increasingly the middle class. We, uh, the, you know, the mental health infrastructure in this country has just been decimated. You know, we've all traveled in places and seen, you know, homeless, mentally ill people on the street. And unfortunately, many times they're put in prison and CIW has a whole section that that's all they do is treat mentally, mentally ill people. Um, different births, you know, as far and when I look at it, you know, people, there's that expression there for the grace of God, go I, different births, di births of different par parents. I could have, I could have ended up at CIW. Um, and I would say the prisoner, the inmate is a human being, his, his or her humanity, even in the face of a heinous crime. And yes, some of these people, some of these women have done heinous things. I will not deny that. But yes, they've done that, but that doesn't negate the fact that they're still human beings and that should be recognized. I I've, I've have officers that tell me, yeah, these are some pretty terrible people, but we still need to treat them as human beings. So we need to realize that. So thank you so much for a Yeka, you got muted somehow. Um, thank you for allowing me to share this with you. Um, if, um, if there's some time, if you had any questions or wanted to ask about anything, I'm open. Or if, if not, you know, the rest of your lovely service. <laughs> I have a feeling there's going to